Good morning. Today is Saturday, May 2nd, and I am starting Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire reading vlog. So I have just been outside on the back deck enjoying my coffee and the first three chapters in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and Dudley's diet is horrifying. And at some point I have to do, I think, a full episode dedicated to fatness in children's literature because it's it's a thing and it's gross uh the fat phobia in a lot of children's literature including harry potter so i'm going to try and read as much of goblet of fire as i can today because i have two interviews with friends of mine to talk about different topics that i've pitched for this book it should be interesting and i'm super excited to try this i am looking at death eaters as nazis and I'm also looking at masculinity. Oh, and I'm also supposed to be looking for like the house elf stuff, the first wave feminism as well. So I have three episodes planned for this book. All right, so something worth noting is the disability rep with Mad-Eyed Moody. I mean, his name is one thing, but then also that everybody is frightened by him because of his disfigurement. And also that the Wizarding Society isn't able to come up with better magical solutions to a peg leg and a glass eye. I mean, his glass eye is actually kind of cool. It's like a an accessibility device that I guess gives him more of an advantage than a like an eye transplant, a magical eye transplant or something like that. But uh, I'd be curious to see discussions around ability and Mad-Eyed Moody. I have to do some research there. Good morning! Today is Monday, May 4th. Yesterday it was beautiful outside. It was 30 degrees. I spent the whole afternoon reading outside, enjoying the backyard. Today it's 12 degrees. I'm in my cozy sweater. I woke up randomly at 3 a.m. this morning, which is like my old wake-up time. I uh, couldn't get back to sleep and decided, fuck it, better start my day. So I pumped my body full of caffeine, filmed, I did some video editing. But now that my video is rendering, I am going to continue on with Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So where were we? Where did I leave off yesterday? Mad-Eye Moody is a better teacher than like any of the humans that Dumbledore has hired in the past three years. The other three people that have been hired by Dumbledore are not remotely qualified to teach children. So you had a timid adventurer, like an adventurer suffering from PTSD in Professor Quirrell. You had a fraudulent writer, and then you had a never been employed werewolf who just so happened to have the skills to teach. And then you hire somebody who actually has experience working in the field. A former or a former dark wizard catcher. Moody and folks in Moody's position should be the hires that Dumbledore is making. Surely once you get old enough that you don't want to run around catching dark wizards, you could teach. Dumbledore's incompetence, my friends. Today I am picking up with uh, Harry has just had his name spit out by the Goblet of Fire and Dumbledore has calmly asked him if he did it. Um, and something that I want to point out is um, 232. Dumbledore goes, did you ask an older student to put it in the Goblet of Fire for you? No, said Harry. Everyone thinks he's lying. And then McGonagall goes like, Harry couldn't have crossed the line himself. And as Professor Dumbledore believes that he did not persuade an older student to do it for him, I'm sure that should be good enough for everyone else. So does that mean that you didn't have to enter yourself. So like they were just counting on the students to be honest and to only enter their own names, but that if Fred and George had wanted to, they could have like got Angelina Johnson to like drop in three names into the cup or just other 17 year old Gryffindor friends to go over and drop their name in the cup. Like if you don't have to enter your own name, that is a, that is a huge, flaw in the age line. It's so trusting and that nobody did it? That nobody was smart enough to be like, well, what if I just ask my older brother to walk the thing over the line? Hello, good morning. It is May the 5th. I have had a very productive morning, worked out. My legs are <laughs> noodly. I did uh, 
lots of lunges and squats today and then I went for a run then I put all my laundry away it's kind of fun because I put all my work clothes away like all of my uh, like cotton black t-shirts and yoga pants I put those all away and I've been wearing just fun stuff and I found this sweater buried in the back of my closet that I haven't worn I got this for my 21st birthday because like I look at all of these clothes and I, I love these clothes but I rarely get to wear them and so I'm thinking about taking this time in uh, quarantine to dress fancy every day here's a you can kind of see my my skirt in the mirror there this is one of my favorite skirts it has pockets um, I got this for our dance lessons because everybody always dressed really fancy to our dance lessons and so I have a couple of dresses in here that are just gorgeous and perfect for like a swing dance and twirling uh, the point being that uh, my wardrobe alternates between like dead on the outside as I am on the inside all black and then all of the colors that I want to be the person who can wear colors but rarely wears colors and so I feel like it might be fun to wear a lot of these things while I'm in quarantine and nobody's looking at me and see what I still like because basically everything that I've purchased since starting work at Indigo is black. Uh, the day-to-day -day clothes that we wear in operations are like grubby because you are scuttling around on the floor, you're climbing ladders, you're breaking down boxes, you're taking the trash out, you're moving skids. Um, and like I have ripped so much clothing. I have never worn out the knees of my jeans before until I started working at Indigo. Like I'll occasionally put on things for uh, videos and I've been trying to do that in the last little bit and it feels really weird because they're clothes that I have very uh, fond memories of, like of wearing out in the world but they are not clothes that I wear in my day-to-day -day now and so I think quarantine might be a fun way to purge my closet. That is a very very big tangent and I know that's not what we talk about on this channel but if you want to see me clean out my closet let me know. Today we're reading Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and today I might also try and pre-film some stuff from my MA thesis. I'm gonna wait for my hair to dry um, before I start filming so that I can sort of uh, not look like a drowned rat. I like how they were like, oh, we're gonna make the Triwizard Tournament safer so that no one dies. So then they import nesting mother dragons that take 30 wizards to control each from the sounds of it. If I'm reading this right, a bananas amount of fully qualified dragon trained wizards that are working on these dragons that they're going to let wizards who haven't graduated from school yet try and steal an egg from. And this is the task that is deemed not as dangerous. The wizarding world has very strange ideas of what is child appropriate. <laughs> it, it's bananas. It's absolutely, I mean, it makes for a great story, but it's absolutely bananas to think about. So Harry has just done the first task, uh, dragons and all that jazz. I stand by my previous statement that, that is absolutely bananas that they considered that safe. Better than Quidditch though. Like these tasks are way better than Quidditch. I really struggle with spew and I'm curious what was supposed to be happening with that because Hermione comes from the real world. Like, it's supposed to be a mirror of the real world, like the London that they live in, right? So presumably, uh, Britain is one of the biggest colonizers. They have a huge history of slavery. I'm surprised that Hermione is the only one upset by the fact that a lot of uh, Hogwarts is run by enslaved uh, sentient magical creatures like that Hermione is the one that's upset by it and not Harry who also comes from that world I could see Ron who is from a pure-blooded family has grown up entirely immersed in the wizarding world so presumably it's a thing that is known that wealthy families have access to, that it's sort of a perk of being of a long line of wizards because the house elves get passed down um, and they they work for families for generations. Like, 
Winky just mentioned that uh, she's ashamed that she was dismissed because her family, like her mother worked for the Crouch family and her grandmother worked for the Crouch family. So she is deeply ashamed to have been freed. That the house elves are so complacent that it's only Dobby, Dobby that seems to have an issue with uh, his enslavement. Now, whether that's because Dobby was abused, like it seems like Winky, Winky hasn't been abused. The Hogwarts house elves are not abused. Uh, it seems like they are left entirely to their own devices because nobody knows that they exist, right? Unless you've been in the kitchens, most people probably don't know that Hogwarts is run by an enslaved labor force. Like, it's not like the students are going around kicking them and making them put their hands in the ovens, and it's not like Dumbledore is doing that. There's this really concerning scene that I just finished in which Harry, Ron, and Hermione go into the kitchens. Like, slavery is wrong. There's no debate. Slavery is wrong. Uh, people deserve to be paid a fair wage for their labor. Uh, they deserve sick leave. They deserve days off. All of this applies to the house elves. But the house elves are so genuinely happy and proud to work at Hogwarts, to work in this like long established institution, to have their labor recognized as worthwhile. Like when they make Ron a cup of tea and he's like, oh, this is excellent. They're like, oh, thank you. Thank you for acknowledging my excellent work. And they're happy about it. I, do, I am genuinely confused about the messaging of this book because to just point out that slavery exists and then give us the example of the happy slave seems like why even bring it up at all? There is one elf, Dobby, who is critical of enslavement and who demands payment as he should, but he's not the norm and he's not convincing his peers like... Yeah, you can still work for Hogwarts, but you all deserve a wage. You deserve to be paid for your labor. And I don't I don't know what the purpose of this is other than to illustrate uh, some aspect of Hermione's character, that she is an activist, that she's empathetic, and to show how she learns how to form community and form a group and make those changes for Order of the Phoenix. So Ron just noticed Hermione's teeth have been shrunk beyond what they normally were because Malfoy, uh, at the beginning of the novel, blasted her with a spell that caused her teeth to just grow uncontrollably. And so she had Madame Pomfrey shrink them um, until they were, like, not as big. Uh, she's been described as having rodent-like teeth throughout the books. Um, and it has suddenly dawned on me the magical potential of being able to grow and shrink things, right? If you buy a dress and it fits perfectly in the waist and hips, but the top is too big, uh, you could either shrink the top to fit your chest or you could engorge your chest to fit the dress, right? You know, I, I would imagine that depending on how skilled you are, if you have like a, a bump in your nose, you could shrink the bump. Like, I wonder to what degree this magic could be used and abused. I guess wizarding culture doesn't have any visual media, really, right? Like, they... They're very secretive, so they don't have, like, a television station. They're more old-fashioned, so they have radio. They have the Daily Prophet, but the Daily Prophet probably isn't printing, like, a fashion magazine. I am curious about how, like, pure-blood wizards view their body and their appearance versus how uh, children who have grown up in the muggle world and who return to the muggle world every summer experience their bodies? And this is a question that cannot be answered and should not be answered because J.K. Rowling is... she's tweet happy. But I wonder about the impact of, like, not having such a visual culture on the impact of wizards. Like, we learn that they are squeezing boobotuber pus 
uh, so that Madame Pomfrey can make like an acne remedy. So clearly wizards don't like uh, acne. They like to have clear skin and that acne shouldn't be cursed off because you could accidentally curse your nose off. Like the potential for magic, like magical altering if you are skilled enough at certain spells. I just find it interesting. And it's interesting that none of our students really take advantage of that other than Hermione. Uh, quote, Harry's other presents were much more satisfactory than Dobby's odd socks, with the obvious exception of the Dursleys, which consisted of a single tissue, an all-time low. End quote. Dobby handmade socks with snitch patterns and broom patterns on them. He saved up his wages and he bought the wool and he put in the time to knit socks for Harry Potter. And Harry Potter doesn't think that this gift is satisfactory. This is the best fucking gift. I love when people hand make gifts. The time that somebody has put into something is so much more meaningful than the object that that somebody thought of me with that much foresight it it's overwhelming and like that harry doesn't appreciate it is sad it's deeply sad and like i don't know i think it's partly because i work in retail and like i see uh the like very corporate side of christmas and the last minute desperation buying it's always men hashtag no tall men but uh, it, it's always men who are in the store December 23rd, December 24th, and they will buy literally anything that you still have in store that you could put in their hands. Like zero thought goes into it. They always get gift receipts. It's just an exchange of money. Some of these men would buy the fixtures. Like they'd buy the, the disgusting chairs and tables if it was all that was left in the store with a gift receipt, of course. The ugliness of what Christmas has become for a lot of people. I think it's now one of my least favorite times of year. I used to really enjoy Christmas. I just feel like Harry not valuing this gift, considering the Dursleys have never treated him well, have never put any love or care into a gift. To have somebody who has so little like Dobby, gift him something that he spent some money on, spent some lab like time on. It's shitty, especially because they like again at the beginning of Philosopher's Stone, Harry Potter talks or Harry talks about how on the train he he buys all those sweets and he shares them with Ron. He he gives this gift and it's the act of giving that makes him feel really good because he's never had the money to buy anyone a present before, to buy sweets, to share those sweets with anyone. So you would think that Harry of all people would understand the value of time and money and just the value of a thoughtful gift and what the act of giving means. Um, and then the Dursleys, who are well off enough, gift him a single tissue. Again, that's one of those things where I don't need a gift. Send me a card. I think a card from the Dursleys being like, Merry Christmas, no gift, would be more meaningful than the sad attempt at a gift. And I, I don't know. Gift giving is something that I struggle with. As somebody who survived for Christmases in the retail setting, gifting has shifted for me a lot. Total tangent. Harry's an asshole. <laughs> Mad-Eyed Moody can see through their dress robes. Page 354. Nice socks, Potter, Moody growled as he passed, his magical eye staring through Harry's robes. Staring through Harry's robes. He's so creepy, Pervardi whispered as Moody clunked away. I don't think that eye should be allowed. It shouldn't. If it can see through people's clothes, through children's clothes. What the fuck? Hello, welcome to day three hair. Uh, today is May 6th. I have a video rendering, it's my May TBR, and I am sitting down to my second cup of coffee. It is 11.20 now. I have been uh, learning how to mosaic crochet. I feel like something has gone slightly wrong with mine. Like, I, I don't don't know what it is but it feels like 
I don't know, it's symmetrical, but I, maybe it's just how the light catches the crochets in the different, the double crochets in the different directions. But it really looks like there's a, like a clear line here and like it does the same, I don't know. I don't know, we'll see how this turns out. So it's gonna be a, a shawl. Right now it's like a dog bib. Um, so that's what I have been uh, doing. This is the last of my detour dark roast. I am deeply upset, but this does mean that I might be able to check out the Collective Arts Detour collab. The only thing is I am not going to order enough to get free shipping. I'm going to have to make like a, a trip and get coffee and I can't decide if that's worth it, right? Because like really shouldn't be going anywhere right now. But also coffee gives me life, so. We have just had the Yule Ball. Hermione and Ron have had that blowout. They found out that Snape and Karkaroff are talking about something sketchy together. Um, don't know what yet. They also overheard Hagrid uh, accusing Madame Maxine of being a half giant. Scandal. That is where I'm at. That's where we're picking up with today. And I will uh, check in with you guys in a little bit. Okay, so I am reading the Egg and the Eye, which is chapter 25 of Goblet of Fire. And uh, this is illuminating in many ways. First of all, the prefects have access to a giant sex bathroom. Um, so there's that. It was softly lit by a splendid candle-filled chandelier and everything was made of white marble, including what looked like an empty rectangular swimming pool sunk into the middle of the floor. So there's just like this this giant, sexy, hot tub, mood lit with candles. The second thing is that Moaning Myrtle often comes to watch the prefects bathe. Harry goes, have you been spying on Cedric Diggory too? What do you do, sneak up here in the evenings and watch the prefects bathe? And she goes, sometimes, but I've never come out to speak to anyone before. So they have like a peeping Tom of Moaning Myrtle watching the prefects bathe and presumably do other things because prefects are all older teens. And then uh, Hogwarts puts raw sewage into the lake. We learn that Moaning Myrtle sometimes gets accidentally flushed out into the lake when somebody flushes her toilet and she's not expecting it. This is just wholly illuminating. Up outside has not improved my hair. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just finished Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and wow, wow, does this take an adult turn. I knew what happened, but it's still a little bit alarming to go from Prisoner of Azkaban where time turners exist and you can just undo a death. You get to Goblet of Fire and everybody's dead for real. Everybody's dead for real, including an innocent little boy. Like, if time turners are still a thing, wouldn't this be a time to get a time turner and to go back to before Harry and Cedric touched the port key, like surely of all of the times to use a time turner to change history, this would be the time, right? This would be the time for Dumbledore to use a time turner, pop himself into the middle of that maze and unporky the port key, just stop the Triwizard Tournament. Well, I guess he can't see himself. But but regardless, like, the Time Turners introduced such a problem because now at any point, it's like, well, stopping Voldemort from coming back. Like, that's a good use of the Time Turner. I hate to say it, but better than saving a hippogriff and somebody, uh, just another regular old human. Oh my gosh, there's so much sunscreen in my hair now. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Time Turners introduce so many problems into this text and I'm sad that they happened. I think it's a regret for a lot of people that they were introduced into the series at all because they take like they're just such a, a deus ex machina, right? Like they should be used for so many things including this, right? Like if they use the time turners here, many innocent lives would be saved. What else do I want to say? It makes me deeply upset that Mrs. Weasley provides Harry with more love and attention than he has ever had in his life, like more motherly attention. Like when he's in the hospital bed, 
she sort of smooths the blankets and then when he gets really upset she hugs him and it's like it, the closest he's ever come to being hugged by a mother hugged by a mother and it makes me think about like all of the times that Harry as a small child like probably got the flu and he was tucked up in bed no not in bed he was shut in his cupboard under the stairs to just be sick alone like you know petunia wouldn't have been there like putting a cold cloth on his forehead taking his temperature if he died in the cupboard under the stairs that would be all the better for the dursleys like the just the gross abuse it's absolutely mind-boggling and then also that uh harry doesn't even expect like the the visitor's day for the the champions he doesn't expect anyone to show up and he doesn't go over to the room where all the champions are with their families because he knows the dursleys won't show up um and he's just gonna go off to the library and like when uh the weasleys show up for him it <laughs> it uh I don't, I don't know. I found um, the Weasleys' uh, love for Harry very... I'm getting emotional about it now. And I can't touch my eyes because everything's covered in sunscreen and that's going to hurt. Um, I, I'm happy that Harry got to experience love from the Weasleys. And I'm also like just deeply devastated that... Harry experienced that abuse. Um, <laughs> I was, I'm genuinely upset. I am genuinely upset in a way that I have never been um, at this aspect. I think uh, reading this time specifically, uh, paying attention to not Hermione. <laughs> because the last time I read these books, the last few times I read these books, I read and reread them over and over during my MA thesis that year while I was uh, writing on them, uh, I was looking at Hermione specifically and sort of ignored everything else. Like anything else in the books really weren't that important to me. Reading them this time, sort of trying to take them in as a whole, but also to look for the things that I'm planning episodes on, like Harry's trauma, like his childhood trauma and how that affects him has me actually paying attention to these deeply troubling situations and uh it's heartbreaking the other thing that's heartbreaking is uh neville harry in his four years of being like literally a few beds over from neville has never asked him why he lives with his grandmother neville has never felt close enough to anyone to share that his parents were tortured into insanity by Voldemort, that they are just shells of humans that are still alive that he still visits. Um, Neville and Harry actually have a lot more in common than uh, Harry and Ron or Harry and Hermione. And I guess the fact that Harry learns something in this book about Neville and is learning how to empathy, how to be a good human, the other thing I want to call attention to is Dumbledore's speech honoring Cedric Diggory. There is some... I'm going to read it. There is much I would like to say to you tonight, said Dumbledore, but I must first acknowledge the loss of a very fine person who should be sitting here. He gestured towards the Hufflepuffs, enjoying our feast with us. I would like you all please to stand and raise your glasses to Cedric Diggory. And they did, and they toast to him. And uh, further down... Dumbledore continues, Cedric was a person who exemplified many of the qualities which distinguish Hufflepuff House. And I just like to call attention to the fact that Dumbledore isn't using gendered language. He didn't call Cedric a fine man or a fine wizard. He called him a fine person. And he's not a man or a wizard who exemplified Hufflepuff qualities. He's a person. I think it's interesting that he calls attention to Cedric's personhood. This book says a lot about uh, masculinity and about 
the types of men we see at work in the world. And I'm really excited to interview my friend, Keely. I think it's interesting that in a moment where Dumbledore could really acknowledge the gender of Cedric Diggory and like uphold him as this epitome of masculinity, like something that men should aspire to, uh, the other Hogwarts boys should aspire to, he calls upon his personhood so that everybody should aspire to be like Cedric. Uh, I don't really know what to do beyond that, but I'm also really excited to talk about masculinity in this book. Uh, so that's where I'm gonna leave the vlog. Um, I have a lot of work to do this time in terms of the scheduled episodes. I'm super excited for the two interviews that I have planned. Yeah, stay tuned for episodes on Death Eaters as Nazis, masculinity, and um, oppression. So like prejudice and oppression and what's going on with Hermione and the house elves. Some heavy topics here, but I'm hoping that we can also joke a little bit about Wands' dicks because the earlier books failed to highlight the, uh, the Wands are dicks. This one makes up for it. Let me know your thoughts on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire in the comments down below. Thank you to my patrons who make videos like this possible. I really appreciate the work that they enable me to do. If you're interested in becoming a patron, in supporting this series, in tipping me for the work that I do on this series, a link to the Patreon page is in the description box down below. I hope everyone is staying safe and I will see you soon. Bye.